gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce one of Britain's leading politicians, the Right Honourable David Blunkett, Member of Parliament for Sheffield Brightside. Mr Blunkett has been one of the major architects of new Labour. After 14 years out of office, when Labour often seemed unelectable, Mr Blunkett was one of the team who made possibly an equally long stint out of, off of office for the Conservatives. In Tony Blair's first period in office, starting in 1997, Mr. Blunkett was Minister for Education and Employment. Education was very much the file which Tony Blair claimed would be the priority for his government. And Mr. Blunkett oversaw huge reforms, perhaps the most controversial being the introduction of tuition fees at British public universities. In Tony Blair's second term, after the election in 2001, Mr. Blunkett was appointed Home Secretary. His was a very daunting task, taking over this file just after the 9-11 attacks in the United States. And he was responsible for a number of very controversial pieces of legislation, including the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act and the Criminal Justice Act 2003. Perhaps one of the things for which he will be most remembered is his attempt, unsuccessful, to introduce identity cards. In Tony Blair's third and final term in office, David Blunkett was Secretary of State for Works and Pensions and had to face Britain's aging population and the resulting pensions crisis. Mr. Blunkett has had an extraordinary influence on British politics, but also on British life. I know of no other British politician who has been the subject of so many television and radio programs, who has inspired two West End plays and even a musical. But today, he's going to talk to us about Tony Blair's legacy. As one of the members of the inner circle, there is no one, I believe, who is better placed to tell us what Mr. Blair will leave as a lasting impact. Mr. Blunkett, please. Hi, Commissioner Dorian, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation to speak this evening. Um, I promise I'm not going to sing, so you'll be spared uh, a musical. Uh, my, my wife Margaret and I have been in Australia um, for the last fortnight meeting uh, Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard and uh, their finance minister, Lindsay Tanner. And I thought I'd just tell you about the Aussie sense of humour. We were about to meet Lindsay Tanner and we got stuck in a lift in the hotel. We, got, we were between floors five and six for almost an hour. And um, apart from the fact that the little guy, when he first came, said, how many of you are in there? I said, just me and my wife. He said, make the best of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, he came back a few minutes later, he knocks on the, uh, the, the casing of the lift shaft and he says, are you still in there? I said, where the hell do you think we've gone? <laughs> so we've had an interesting fortnight, one, one way or another. Um, is New Labour dead? No, I don't believe it is. What will be the Blair legacy? Let me talk to you about that tonight. I think it's an interesting, uh, controversial area. I think probably one of the Blair legacies will be the uh, present leader of the Conservative Party, David Cameron. He would never have emerged uh, had Tony Blair not had a legacy, which the previous three leaders of the Conservative Party in Britain, William Hague, uh, Ian Duncan Smith and Michael Howard, uh, had completely failed to be able to shift the British electorate uh, or the, uh, the way in which the Blair government and subsequently of course now Gordon Brown had dominated the reform agenda and it's taken till now for the Conservatives to respond to what was not simply a reversal of Margaret Thatcher's refusal to accept that there was such a thing as society but actually to be able to forge an understanding of what the future holds. Tony Blair, Dorian mentioned it, gave me the education and employment brief in 97 when the mantra was education, 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 
and I believed it, and I, I still do, by the way. We had a coherent education structure because I was responsible for the education system from the very earliest moment a child was born, and we developed a program called Sure Start uh, through the development of comprehensive childcare, uh, nursery education provision for the first time, and the whole of primary, secondary, further, and higher education, including skills. All of that has been broken up. I've never been quite sure what happens when I left departments, because in the education and employment department, when I left, it was split three ways. When I left the home office, it was eventually split two ways. Now, I'm not sure whether that meant that people felt I'd done such a lousy job that it would take at least two or three people to do it, or whether it was such a daunting task to take on the wonderful legacy of David Blunkett that they thought that no one person could actually manage it. You pay your money and you take your choice. All I know is that I enjoyed doing the education brief enormously. Uh, I was with Margaret this afternoon here in Singapore and we went into a little tea room and I sat on one of these little stools that you have and it reminded me of sitting on a very tiny uh, stool in the first new nursery that Tony Blair and I went to open in the East End of London. And I was trying to be really friendly and uh, break down the, the, the barriers of the formalities of politicians. And I put my arm around the little person next to me and I said, how old are you, my dear? 23, she said. <laughs> T turned out to be a nursery nurse. And, uh, of course, when I, when I was Home Secretary, I brought in new sex offenders laws. So if it had been retrospective, I might have been caught by them. We, we, we had an interesting time. I was responsible for a massive investment in something you're very familiar with uh, here in Singapore, which is the development of information technology. We were way behind the door. We were so far behind the door uh, in government that people were hardly getting used to using fax machines when we came in in 97, never mind uh, the embryonic uh, email system. Uh, we had ministers came into their offices and computers had been bought, but very few of them were actually operating. Um, they'd been kind enough to prepare for my arrival in the department by getting equipment that could be operated and uh, Braille could be transcribed from the new software system that had been developed so that they didn't have to learn Braille, they just need, needed to know how to operate the computer. And they brought a, a, a new embosser. And I took the, the first uh, folder that they'd given me across to Downing Street to make a presentation on the policies we were going to lay out uh, in the Queen's speech in 97. And uh, when I opened it, I couldn't read a single word of the Braille. And I just ad-libbed as I do best of all, and Tony didn't notice, he didn't notice then, and he didn't notice later when I was ad-libbing, so I got away with it, and that was fine, and I went back to the department and said, well, we got away with it that time, but next time I really would like to be able to read the notes, and they, they shot off, and they came back a few minutes later, and they said, Secretary of State, we, we know what went wrong, I said, what was the problem? They said, we brought the Braille transcriber from Sweden, and we haven't switched it over. So I was attempting to read Swedish. I don't know. I think there are about 20 different languages in, uh, spoken in the room this evening, but I don't know whether Swedish is one of them. You forgive me. It's difficult enough understanding Swedish when it's spoken, but when it's written in Braille, it's virtually impossible. So that, that was uh, both an amusing incident, but also an indication of the desperate need to bring British government and delivery actually up to date. The agenda that Tony Blair was laying out, in conjunction with Gordon Brown, because they'd worked very closely together, was to address the enormity of globalization, of the rapid change which was overtaking the world, in which if the United Kingdom didn't come up to date very quickly, we were going to be left way behind. You see this in this region with the enormous driving force of what is modern China. We were beginning to grasp that this was going to happen uh, with China and India and in the future Indonesia. And the picture that Tony Blair and Gordon Brown were painting and that many of us were signing up to was a reform agenda that took on the enormity of globalization in terms of 
the economic challenge and the challenge of modern communications, the rapidity with which information could be both transmitted and downloaded across the world, the transformation of what people saw and heard and experienced in their own lives from satellite, from text, from now iPhone. The change that brought in terms of their understanding of the world and the challenges and the fears that it also brought with it. Because alongside the changes in the global economy and the need to reform to take those on, the need to be able to invest in and to understand the potential of information technology were other major changes that you're familiar with. The changes of international mobility of men and women, which for the United Kingdom brought both the potential of dynamism and energy and young people coming in to be able to contribute to what was a very successful economy and growth. But at the same time, the fear of difference, the rapid change in culture, the way in which people who didn't experience mobility and globalization, who weren't metropolitan in the sense that, like most of us in this room, are able to and have traveled, have had access to higher education, the people I represent in the northeast of Sheffield simply saw the world changing rapidly around them without necessarily the potential to be able to benefit from it. They saw the, the certainties that they understood changing around them. And by, of course, 2001, we have the added factor of the stark reality of global insecurity, reinforced, of course, by what happened in Afghanistan and the development uh, of al-Qaeda uh, as a, a force facilitated initially by the Taliban that's still with us today, but also the fear and insecurity that that brought in terms of what would happen were we unsuccessful in Iraq. And I just want to say, because I think it's, you, you can't talk about the Blair legacy and uh, what people will see as Tony Blair's successes and failures without understanding the enormous divisions that existed and still do within the Labour Party and within Britain as well as across the globe about the incursion into Iraq. I'm uh, one of those people who have not changed my mind. I believe that on the 7th of November 2002 when the UN Security Council unanimously took a decision to pass the resolution 1441 when they believed that if weapons didn't exist, the potential to develop them quickly certainly did, that there had to be a lesson taught to Saddam Hussein and there had to be an outcome which changed the nature and balance of power within the region who could have thought that that change in power and relationship would lead to the insecurity which emerges from Iran today. But it was a decision taken with the best intentions and it was also taken with Tony Blair's belief that he had to be close to and alongside the United States, influencing for the better, trying to determine what the outcome would be after the military incursion. And if we failed, in my view, if we failed at all in terms of Iraq, it was the failure of the preparation and the delivery of the aftermath of those first three and a half weeks. And Tony will, I think, always regret, because he's a very close friend of mine, the, the fact that we didn't have greater influence, that we hadn't put enough time and energy into preventing Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld from attempting to run things from Washington to dismember not just the, uh, the military, but the police, the public administration system, the local government framework within Iraq, which has taken us six years to, to rebuild. So one of the legacies of Blairism will be the simmering resentment in Britain and across many parts of the world about our joining with the US in terms of going into Iraq uh, in March 2003. But another will be a grasp of the enormity of the insecurity and risks that really do exist from Al-Qaeda and the understanding of a different sort 
of terrorism to anything that we'd experienced before, non-negotiable, uh, non-arguable, non-reasoning in terms of sitting down and being able to work out what it is other than the total destruction of our own way of life and our well-being and our ability to be in a room like this tonight and to talk and debate and discuss and to change the world by peaceful means other than the complete destruction of all those tenets of everything we stand for in modern democracy there can be no negotiation and I tried to get this across when I was Home Secretary with the backing of Tony Blair you, you can't threaten people with prison or with the normal judicial system you can't actually have the normal precepts of prevention by laying down terms of what punishment will be available to people who are prepared to take their own life in taking the lives of others. Suicide bombers aren't afraid of spending time in prison or of being executed. People who are prepared to destroy everything around them don't give a damn about the normal tenets of a proper balance between parliamentary democracy and judicial independence and once you understand that then you begin to grasp the enormity of the threat and the nature uh, of what has existed so a second tenant of Tony Blair's uh, legacy in Britain and I believe that that influence elsewhere as well is to have begun to understand what it is that we were dealing with but the primary and I think tonight my, my main message is that Tony Blair's legacy in Britain was to stop a nostalgia for an old Labour past where things would be done from the top down, where we would paternalise, where we would tell people that we would resolve their problems on the one hand, and a free market free-for-all of the Thatcher era on the other, where people believed and still do despite what's happened over the last two years that free markets are the way to deliver and that government is mainly interference and should be eschewed at all costs and I think Tony was instrumental in trying to get across that enterprise and social responsibility can go hand in hand that you can have economic dynamism with social justice that you can actually develop a sense of mutuality whilst giving people the freedom and the understanding that they stand on their own feet, that they are self-reliant and self-determinant. I believe that to my very core. I was given the opportunity by going to evening school and when I got a job, being released from work for a day a week, to get qualifications that I never got at school. I had a principal of the school for the blind that I went to who would got a doctorate, who didn't believe that blind children should be put in for examinations. I don't know how the hell he thought he got where he got to without uh, qualifications, but one thing struck me by the age of 16. I knew I wasn't going to get anywhere if I didn't grasp the opportunity of education, but other people made that opportunity possible. But they couldn't ensure that I took that chance and used my talent. That was down to me. So the balance between individual self-determination and self-reliance on the one hand and mutuality and interdetermination together on the other is something that I believe will be a lasting legacy and the present Conservative Party in Britain are struggling to emulate that. David Cameron's ability to perform on television, his quick footedness in difficult situations, his ability to be able to respond quickly are reminiscent of Tony Blair from 1994 when he was elected as leader of the, the then opposition Labour Party uh, but there is one big difference we did have clear economic policy we did have uh, clear policies on economic uh, on education and employment issues we weren't quite so clear what we were going to do on the health service but we've uh, resolved some of those difficulties since we've now turned around the National Health Service uh, and we have a clarity of purpose in terms of the big global issues such as climate change. Our opposition is still struggling to determine what they will do should they win and they're in a very powerful position to do so 
in an election which will probably be on May the 6th next year. They're struggling because we haven't resolved yet some of the problems ourselves. So let me tell you what the Blair legacy will not have resolved. We haven't resolved the difficulty of devolving services to a more localised level, to giving greater freedom to managers to manage, for head teachers to be responsible for schools, which we've done, and then determine who's accountable for the outcome. We still have a health service which is devolved to foundation trusts so that the managers are responsible for running the hospitals, the primary care trusts are responsible for commissioning services, GPs running their own practices. My wife Margaret is here tonight, is a, is a, a doctor in a, and heads a GP practice in Sheffield. But when things go wrong, it's still the Secretary of State for Health who has to stand up in the House of Commons and answer for the individual aspects of what's gone wrong at local level. When head teachers do not handle the school budgets or the school outcomes, it's still the Secretary of State for what is now called Children's Schools and Families. Even I have a problem keeping up with the change of names of government departments in Britain, so if you have difficulty, then you, you can well be forgiven. Uh, it's the Children's Schools and Families Secretary that stands up to answer. In local government, we, we give greater freedom back to local government, but it's the Secretary of State for local government and communities that has to answer. So we've still got these contradictions, but there are some bigger ones as well. And I would suggest that an incoming Conservative government have got some big problems in terms of global issues. They don't want to be part of the mainstream right in the European Union and they don't want the British government to be closely em embodied in and embedded in the European institutions but they criticise the present government for being too close to America as well uh, in fact there are people within my own party who don't want to be too close to Europe and don't want to be too close to America, they want us to sort of hover in the Azores somewhere out there in the middle of nowhere uh, with no influence, no friends and no power. Um, I think giving the presidency of the European Council to a Belgium is about as near as you can get to the Azores actually in terms of <laughs> influence and power across the world. The, the, our opposition um, want a Bill of Rights but they don't want the Human Rights Act. They want a commitment to voluntary and charitable organisations, what we call the third sector, but they don't want them to campaign. They want them to be neutralised. And I think that these are issues which whoever wins the election will need to be resolved. Britain needs to decide its place in the world. Are we a small island of 60 million off the coast of Europe are we an, or are we an essential part of a greater Europe? actually being able to provide at least some counterweight to China and India and the United States. Uh, are we able to determine our place in the world within the United Nations? And what part does continuing to hold nuclear weapons have in that? Where are we in terms of being able to modernize sufficiently to be able to cope with the enormity of global economic change the former finance minister in Sweden was telling me two months ago that he believed that the freeing up of enterprise within China and the saving culture for retirement and for investment in schooling, in education, had led to savings which were then transferred into the US bond market, which then led to the decisions that were taken in the subprime market and the belief that we could go on simply blowing into the balloon and building the bubble forever, which then led to what we now know as the global meltdown over the last 18 months, two years. So we're in it together, whether we like it or not. You're at the centre here in Singapore of seeing those changes taking place much more than we are in, in the UK. But we've got a part to play and the Blair legacy is to have pulled Britain from the middle of the 20th into the 21st century to have at least in part prepared us 
educationally and economically for those changes, to have brought about reform in public services. The downside I've already spelled out in terms of some of the decisions we've taken, but there was one other area which is worth exploring given that this is a faculty dealing with public administration. We talked in the second term about not education, 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 but delivery, delivery, delivery. But we didn't change the mechanism sufficiently for delivery of public services. It's still an unfinished agenda in the United Kingdom. When we came in in 97, we had a genuinely committed, open, neutral civil service. The High Commissioner knows that all of us value that greatly. But we also had a civil service that wasn't and still isn't totally prepared for what it's being asked to do. We didn't develop project management and leadership skills sufficiently. We weren't flexible enough in terms of giving people opportunity to learn new skills. Even at mundane level, people were just allowed to tick along in the same old ways. I'll tell you an amusing but true story, which isn't really fair on the civil service, but I think it illustrates the challenge that we, we had then, and I still believe we have now. A letter to, came into Downing Street the week after we won the election uh, on May the 1st, 1997. It was in handwriting. It was a congratulatory letter for Tony Blair, the new Prime Minister, who of course moved into 10 Downing Street. And it was signed, Loving Pop. And a letter went back from Downing Street, a, a typed letter went back to Downing Street to Tony Blair's father, addressed to Mr. L. Pop. <laughs> and it said, Dear Mr. Pop, Tony Blair has asked us to thank you for your very kind letter congratulating him on his elevation to Prime Minister. And when Sherry Blair found out what had happened, she went absolutely spare. And when I found out what letters were going out in my name from the Department of Education and Employment, I didn't go spare. I actually went down to the uh, unit and I said, look, you've got one of the lousiest jobs in government. You're receiving literally thousands of letters and now gradually email that people have never coped with before. Let's talk about what you would like to send if you have the freedom to do so please send letters that you'd want your grandma to receive. Please take out all the formal jargon. Please just refer letters up to us when you believe that policy needs changing rather than reiterating the policy that you've been enunciating for the last 18 years. And we still, still, 12 and a half years on, are struggling to get people to feel that they are part of the process of change. Not on the side of one political party or another, but that every single person in the public administration system is a part of a cog in a wheel, that they have a part to play in making the world a better place. And if I had my time again, I'd have spent a lot more of the energy and commitment that I gave to actually working alongside and changing the feeling, the attitude, the self-belief of the civil servants who we relied on and still do to make a difference to people's lives. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for a very entertaining and interesting uh, speech. And uh, now I open the floor to questions. Would you please put up your name and uh, when you ask your question, give your name and uh, your organization or your course you're studying. First question, please. And we can have a conversation so if people want to put up for very welcome, because I, I always, you know, even, even after all these years, I, I'm still learning. Hi there. Um, Asif Ali from uh, the National University of Singapore, MPA student. 
I had a question uh, with regards to uh, Gordon Brown's likely successor. Um, if Labour do lose next year, which is looking more and more likely based on the polls, who would you like to see as his successor for the Labour Party? And who do you think will be the likely successor? And also, just another question on the EU leadership. You made a comment alluding to the uh, Belgian minister. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, the Belgian Sorry, can you hear? Um, what were your opinions on Tony Blair's um, ambitions to take up that role? Thank you. First of all, do you want to take one or two more? Okay, well, well, I was going to say, I, if you get into interviewing, if you ever get into the media, le learn a, a, a good lesson from my experience, which is only ask one question, because what you've allowed me to do is answer the bits I really would like to answer. Um, the, the first bit is quite difficult because the minute, I, nothing now is sacred. Everything uh, in terms of speeches can be videoed, recorded. There's not a place in the world, I mean, I'm, Margaret and I are going to Langkawi tomorrow, I'll no doubt find that I'm saying something to her on the beach and somebody will be just behind us recording every word of it. So you have to be extremely careful. I don't think that the election's over until it's over, and the lessons of uh, the, the past defeats of the Labour Party in 1970 and 79 were that we only just lost, and if we'd actually had a bit more clarity and direction, we could li literally have pulled it off. So, you know, miracles do happen. Uh, if we lose, I'd like one of the younger people to come forward and be able to show leadership skills. The people have already indicated that they're... Uh, that they, they would be interested in people like our Foreign Secretary David Miliband and his brother, uh, who's the Energy Secretary at, at Miliband. I used to read their father's books when I was a politics student at university, uh, Ralph Miliband, so it's a small world. Um, but the the her current Home Secretary, uh, Alan Johnson, uh, and perhaps someone you, you don't know, but who is the Chief Secretary, the number two at the Treasury, a man called Liam Byrne, who thinks extremely well and writes well, at least one of the people who is uh, preparing for the future. There's also a young man called James Pennell, who unfortunately decided to resign at, uh, at the beginning of June when we had a reshuffle. I think he thought that other people were going to resign with him. But the other thing you find in politics is that when you jump out of an aircraft, you find that other people have parachutes and you've left yours behind. So uh, it's a dangerous game. Um, I, I would have liked to have seen Tony Blair take on the President of the European Council for one reason, uh, and I, I alluded to it in my speech. I think that it's impossible for Europe to punch its weight in an entirely different global situation uh, if it is fragmented. I understand why President Sarkozy and Angela Merkel don't want a powerful figure at the head of Europe. They want to be seen to be powerful themselves, but separated. Even large countries like Germany have very little power in the, the new global situation. And I don't think that Britain and Europe have come to terms with it yet. I just don't think that Europe understands what's happening in terms of the economy of China and its power, the, the development and potential of India, the, the future perhaps for Indonesia. Uh, and perhaps even the fading power of the United States. I don't think we've begun to understand that at all. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Blunkett. May I just add that uh, we do have one positive element in all this, and that is we have Cathy Ashton as the new EU High Representative. And uh, speaking on a personal note, since I've been working for her as a Trade Commissioner, I think she's going to be an excellent choice. Well, I, I, I can at least endorse that because uh, Kathy and her husband Peter are, are friends of mine and I've stayed in their house. So I'm very glad she's there because you always like to know people who are in positions of influence. Yeah. Especially when you're losing yours. Yeah. <laughs> Next question, please. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Daniel Wadeda. I'm a student at the School of Public Policy. I have two questions. My first question is, um, could you please comment on British-Africa relations since the Labour government came to power in 1997? Mm -hmm. And secondly, 
do you see Tony Blair coming back to power in the foreseeable future as Prime Minister? Yeah. The, the easy bit of your question is the second one. I, ne neither Tony or I believe that that is in the least bit likely. Um, I hope Tony will be able to continue now developing the foundation and the charitable work that he's uh, doing. I hope eventually he'll finish his diaries. Um, because I'm looking forward to reading and seeing what he says about me and them. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't think he, even his wildest dreams. I, I'd like him to be able to play an even bigger part on the world stage. And I think if smaller politicians will get over their own ego and peak, they'll allow him to do so, because he's still got an enormous amount um, to offer. On relations with, with Africa, um, I think that both Tony Blair and Gordon Brown have actually been deeply committed. I, probably not everybody in the room will know that um, t Tony himself is, is giving an enormous amount of time uh, free in Rwanda uh, and with work across Africa, including Sierra Leone, in terms of functioning government. And, and I'm hoping to play a bit of a part with him in that as well, because I think it's really important uh, for the future of Africa. Gordon Brown's commitment to Africa is, is well known on the Global Millennium Goals and I think the two of them together were an important part of what was agreed four years ago at Glen Eagles. It was overtaken in Britain by the fact that we had the attack in London um, the day after. But the Make Poverty History as well as the beginnings of an understanding that we needed a global approach to climate change were begun at Glen Eagles in July 2005 and I think that Britain played a, an important role in that. I, I, as I've tried to illustrate tonight, I don't think we should exaggerate our own role in the world. We're a small country but we can still punch if we know how to do it and how to work with others to do it and whether it's working with uh, Southern Africa where I think we've got an important part to play including, God willing in the future, the rebuilding of Zimbabwe uh, and with uh, functioning governments across Africa where there is enormous potential. Margaret and I were in Kenya and Tanzania uh, this time last year working with Sight Savers International. I think there's a, a very major part co that can be played. I'd like Europe as a whole to do that rather than just the UK. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Jonas, a local student at Hua Chong Institution. Um, my first question will be actually on um, just on your views on actually the attacks that you just mentioned on the 7th of July 2005. Some academics have pointed out that Tony Blair was an unfulfilled Prime Minister and they took this point and pointed out that the British government then didn't understand the nature of terrorism and blamed it on the Iraq war um, that caused the 7-7 London attacks. And the second question would be um, what are your views on Tony Blair's legacy? Would you say that it is an unfulfilled one, um, or would you like to say that it is actually one that is really very fulfilled and um, there are actually very little areas for improvement? Perhaps, uh, if I may just suggest, I think we're getting a little bit short of time, so can I take Let's a few more questions? Let's take some together and then I'll try and give short, sharp answers. Very good. Okay. Some more questions? Yes, please. Good evening. My name is Salman from the I wanted to ask, what's the future of the NHS, would you think? Um, Abedin Mohriz from the uh, Lee Kuan Yew School. Um, is um, New Labour and Blair himself a, uh, part of the Thatcher legacy? And uh, will New, La new Labourism therefore be a, a phase which will eventually be superseded by something else? Um, and also, enjoy yourself in Langkawi. I heard that Tony Blair really enjoyed it last time. You Right, right. <laughs> Very glad to hear it. <laughs> I'll take up just one more yeah. question. Mm. Uh, good evening, Mr. Blunkett. I'm Mr. Lee Peng, and I'm a former National University of Singapore student. I'm a former graduate in political science and sociology. Uh, firstly, thank you so very much for, your, for coming to town and gracing us with your marvelous lecture. The one question I have is about one of Tony Blair's policies. I heard that he said he wanted to be tough on the causes of crime as well as tough on crime itself. You've spoken about some of the laws you've passed during your time as Home Secretary. To what extent do you think 
that Mr. Blair's government has been successful in addressing the causes of crime. I ask this because normally societies need to rely on conditioning its citizens to live in a climate of fear by enforcing laws, passing them, making them fear punishment. But to what extent do you think um, preventing crime by addressing the causes can be applied to other societies such as here in Singapore? Okay. Thank you very much. Shall I take those, Paul? Well, let me take the, the non-Blair um, ones first. The, the future of the NHS. We've done two really important things for the NHS, but it's unfinished business. The first was massive investment because the NHS had been starved of funds. You, you can't deliver if you haven't got the nurses, the doctors, the equipment, the, uh, the drugs, the ability to actually be able to transform what people are working with and the conditions in which they're working. And so the tripling of the amount we've spent on the National Health Service has been important. The second was actually a reform agenda which changed the nature of management. I referred to decentralising, devolving uh, power and authority, developing commissioning. That's still unfinished business, but it has worked dramatically. And alongside it, what were originally called targets, but people don't appear to like the term target, so we now call them entitlements. Uh, what's in a name? Uh, the entitlements are dramatic in there, and it touches on whether the Blair legacy has left anything improved. When we came into office, for most treatments, people were, were waiting 6, 12, 18 months, sometimes two years. There were no uh, guarantees or entitlements for even the most urgent uh, consultancy and treatment programs. Now, for cancer, you are guaranteed to see a consultant immediately and to be treated within two weeks of seeing the consultant. That applies to all emergency uh, surgery. You are guaranteed that you will be treated for all other ailments within 18 weeks. I mean surgery. You're obviously treated by the GP um, uh, immediately. You visit and you're guaranteed uh, a visit within uh, 48 hours. So there's been a complete transformation of what people experience. I still believe it is the most efficient because it's the lowest administrative costs of any health service in the world. I still believe that it is the best in terms of offering whatever your income, whatever the background, whatever the circumstances, the best the world has to offer. But the challenge is very great indeed because the speed with which both technology and drugs are changing makes it very difficult. The second question relating to crime is a very interesting one. We've reduced overall crime by over 30%. We've reduced the big volume crimes like burglary and car theft which were bedeviling Britain by over 40% in the last 12 years. Uh, we've seen a transformation in terms of uh, the way in which uh, young people have been dealt with who set up a youth justice board and youth offending teams. We haven't turned around the absolutely crucial element and that is people understanding that within the family they have responsibility for the behaviour of their own children themselves and those around them. In other words what we now call the respect agenda. Government can put in place the signals the punishment as you described them, the way in which society demonstrates a framework within which it expects its citizens to work mutually in a complex urban society. What it can't do is to alter people's behaviour from inside their heads unless we work with them from the very earliest years. And only now are we intervening with what's called family intervention programmes for the most dysfunctional families, because it's usually in any neighbourhood, just a handful of families that cause the havoc. It's just a handful of people who are the drug pushers. It's a handful of people who are the opinion formers in terms of operating the gangs. It's only a handful of people who possess the, the weapons, either the guns or the knives. 
It's only a handful of kids in school that transform what's acceptable or unacceptable. And that's what we're just beginning to get into. It's something that I was pressing very hard but didn't do enough about when I was Home Secretary, which was to say, let's get inside the issues. And I recently produced a television series. It's actually called Banned Up because we, uh, we took youngsters who rubbed up against the law with their agreement, with their parents' agreement. We had them in for a fortnight. Uh, they were in a cell with former prisoners who are reformed and were telling them what it was really like. But we actually were developing therapies with them and continued to do so when they left the experiment. And instead of 8 out of 10 reoffending, 9 out of 10 didn't reoffend. And it was all about getting inside their heads, trying to get to what had happened. The truth is that if you don't get to a youngster by the time they're 12 or 13, and they're already showing major signs of criminality and dysfunctionality, then you've got a major struggle to turn it around. So we've got to get in very early indeed. And it's got to be a societal change and not just a governmental policy. So society's got to want to, to change itself and to improve. And that is a real struggle for Britain because everybody wants somebody else to do it. And in the end, we've got to do it together, which is probably the biggest failure of, of the time I spent in government because I've preached it all my life which is that we need to build the glue of civil society. The government's major role is enabling and facilitating people changing the world for themselves, not relying on politics and politicians changing it for them. And we still haven't got that message either internally across so that we're not preaching it, and we certainly haven't got it across in terms of uh, a policy development. On the Blair legacy, no, I don't think that the major... Leg, uh, I don't think that Tony Blair was Margaret Thatcher in drag or whatever the other way around uh, is. I think that what Tony Blair was, was yes a reaction to Margaret Thatcher just as David Cameron is a reaction to Tony Blair because we were never going to go back to old labour, to that paternalism, to that top-down welfareism, to that uh, patting people on the head and telling them that we, we were, you know, everything in the garden's rosy and we'll give you certainty and stability and security. When we, we, we can only do that if we put in place changes like freeing up our labour market, saying you will, keep a, you will have a job more, more readily if we have a flexible open labour market than if we have what the French have, which is a very closed labour market. We have substantially lower unemployment even today than the French and Germans because of what happened under Tony Blair. And yes, I think I've answered the question about whether we've transformed opportunity and change, not just in health, but in education, where we've literally transformed in the, in the constituency I represent, not just the conditions in which teachers teach, not just the teacher training to make them more effective and professional and well-equipped, not just the leadership and responsibility of heads for doing the job better, not even just the equipment, but actually the transformation of aspiration of young people and their families to do better, which is why we have so many young people able to go and able to take advantage of higher education, why we, we've now got staying on rates in constituencies like my own, which have been transformed from something like only 40% of 16-year-olds staying on at the age of 16 into further education, up now to 78% and, God willing, much higher in the years to come. It's the beginning of a process. But the lesson I've learned, Dorian, is this. You put a brick in the wall. You build a brick. You put, you put on top of what other people have done before you. And others who come after you either knock it down or they build with you. And then you find when you built the wall that the wind has changed and the hurricane's coming from another direction. There is no day zero where you've waved a magic wand and the task is over. Each generation has to build on the successes or failures of the previous one. And that is why politics, citizenship, democracy is so important and why I hope that every single one of you uh, under the age of 25 in this room will commit yourself to making the world a better place.
Well, I, I think with that, it's almost impossible to have any further questions. <laughs> so I hope you'll join with me and uh, give Mr. Blank a warm <laughs>